Recording in progress. Good morning, Meg. Good morning, Aman. Uh, good morning. Hopefully you can hear me. I can hear you. Hi. Good morning. Thank you. Check, check, mic check. Can you hear us on Zoom? Can I ask if there's like a session going on right now? Can you hear us in the room? Aman, Meg. Hello, Meg, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Oh, perfect. Thank you. And I'm also on screen. <laughs> it's a bit of an awkward setting because um, I'm using the micro like the microphone in the room, but I'm also okay. using my laptop for like to appear on screen. So yeah, it's a bit, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining. <laughs> So is it a break right now? Um, is that what's going on? Yeah, I'm yeah, exactly. Agenda, so I'm not exactly sure. Like, I thought that there's a, people still speaking at the moment. Exactly. So um, the session will start in 15 minutes. Um, so okay. you can just like turn off your camera, get a cup of coffee or some water and everything. And yeah, just be back on time for the session. <laughs> Oh, okay, super. All right. I because I'm looking at the agenda, like on the the PDF, and I thought that like we're starting like in a minute. So okay, cool. I can relax for a minute. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.
the country. It's like yeah, 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 can you hear me? They don't really know, but they have at least reported for duty. They got on the bus. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. Alex, we can hear you. Hello. How are you guys doing?
Good morning, everyone. Um, so welcome to our session. Uh, I was just told that one of the, our speakers, um, Gabenga, will be coming a bit later in the session, so maybe we can start. Um, Alex, over to you for the introductions. Thank you uh, so much. Um, hello, everybody. Good morning from, uh, I was going to say sunny London. It's not sunny yet, but I have high hopes. Um, my name is Alex. Uh, and I am part of Chatham House's Digital Society Initiative. Thank you so, so much to everybody for joining us. Uh, thank you to the IGF for hosting us. For those of you who don't know the Digital Society Initiative, um, we are at Chatham House, uh, which is a sort of uh, the, uh, an international think tank. We work with governments around the world to promote, to protect, um, and to provision digital technology that is open, equitable, and respectful of fundamental democratic values. So we're joined, or I'm joined by my colleagues Yasmin and Jackie, who kindly introduced me. They'll be in the room and they'll lead today's workshop looking at global platform regulation and sort of comparative look at global platform regulation, as well as obviously a superb panel of experts and practitioners. Today's discussion, I think, marks the high, the first high level discussion that we've held around this critical topic and the similarities and the conflicts in uh, in international approaches to digital platforms, I think are critical. Uh, they are critical drivers in shaping the future of the internet. And from our perspective, finding a path forward that negotiates these differences, that negotiates the conflicts often, uh, finding a solution that is multilateral, that is multi-stakeholder, will be the difference, I think, between preserving and building a global open internet uh, or, unfortunately, its gradual breakup. Now, Chatham House is committed. Uh, it's a committed home for these conversations. And today's event is as much an invitation as anything else. As we move into 2023, we hope you will take the opportunity to reach out uh, and to join us in this mission. Now, with that invitation, Yasmin, over to you. Thank you, Alex. Um, and I'm sorry to hear that you're joining us um, before sunrise. I hope you had your <laughs> coffee at least. Um, so good morning to all those in Addis today with me and hello everyone joining us in the cyberspace. Um, thank you for joining us uh, for our discussions today. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. My name is Yasmin from Chatham House. And so I'll be giving you a little teaser first before our stellar panel regarding our work on global platform regulation and some of the key questions basically as a warm-up to our discussions today and to pick you on your brains later on. Um, so if I can have the um, PowerPoints up, please. Thank you. So, you know, we've been on a journey over the past 20 to 30 years, and as the internet grows and has evolved into this giant beast that we have today and that pretty much defines our everyday lives now, governments went from the question of whether to govern technology and if we should govern technology to how so the shift has changed from if to how and rightly so because it's there and it's not going anywhere it will increasingly grow and will grow dependent on it so while governments have been trying to answer the same question they haven't done so in the same way so over the past six months with global partners digital here with jackie representing um at chatham house we've been looking at um how governments are approaching the question of governing digital platforms. And so we have surveyed over um, 55 pieces of key legislation across 50 geographies and looked into each of them against a set of predefined metrics. So for example, here we have an example of Venezuela and uh, we came up with 30 metrics organized around seven categories, which eventually led us to building this huge table on some of the things we could find and we could not find. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, you don't want to see that table at the moment. <laughs> um, but it's, a, it's still a work in progress. And um, we're basically building a paper on that and we're happy to share with you once it's up. Um, and, you know, while we have this giant table, it led us to the question of what does a platform regulation look like worldwide? Um, because obviously they're all doing it differently, but it doesn't mean that there's no pattern to observe. In fact, um, against the set of metrics that we have, for example, we've seen that the average regulatory regime tackles online harms with fining, 71% of them, or blocking platforms for removing content classed as illegal in 75% in a country, in a country once a platform has been notified. So you can see here that there's a sort of difference between 
being notified or not notified. And then there's also provisions in terms of the content that is not um, illegal per se, but in some way it's still seen as harmful. So ranging from pornography, for example, or self-harm content. Um, in short, yeah, it's harmful, but it's also legal, yeah. Um, and so this led us to the question in terms of, in light of the pattern, what types of regulatory uh, regimes are out there? And so we have seen that again, countries are regulating digital platforms differently. So you can see like the little dots here, we've played a bit around with the colors and we started grouping countries together, which by the way, uh, again, we're writing a report on and we're happy to share the paper once it's out there. Um, feel free to reach out to us, um, either to myself, Jackie, or anyone really in the team. We'll be happy to um, talk to you about that on an ad hoc basis. So. The first group that we've identified, um, so first, before I move to the, to, the, to the group, I have to show you like this really fancy thing that with Alex, we built and Jackie. <laughs> but again, it's still a work in progress and it's still really dynamic. So um, of course, like if you want to reach to us to provide some feedback or insights on your um, region or your country, feel, feel free to do so. So the first group that we've identified in those countries are those in, that we call with independent regulation. And what do I mean here is, for example, regulation of digital platforms in these countries are, um, are, uh, are made by an independent authority. There's an explicit mention of freedom of expression and there are limitations in place on the enforcement of regulators' powers in line with the freedom of expression safeguards. And the second group that we have is, called what, is what we call the firm regimes. So in the case of these regulations, we've seen that all of them open the door to prison sentences for individual platform employees and that the regulations have provisions surrounding content that may be legal per se, again, but could be damaging to social order. Um, and the third that the group that we have here are, is for the group of countries focusing on proactive monitoring. So for the countries within this group, all five regimes included have requirements for proactive content moderation and individual employees of platforms may be held liable for failing to moderate content. All of them also contain provisions surrounding legal content that could be damaging to social order, again, like the previous group that we have seen, and sanctions include blocking and restricting access to content of platform, but not all of them extend to prison sentences. Again, I want to reiterate the fact that even though we have all of these groupings based on patterns and commonalities, it does not mean that they're uniform in implementation. It depends on a lot of factors, which leads me to the final part of my presentation. What is missing from this data? Of course, it's fancy, fancy to see like the graph, the data points, but they're not oracles. They provide you insights, but that's not it. So what is missing? One of the key things that I think we need to reflect a bit more is on the local democratic context in each country. How are regulatory instruments developed? translated and applied in the light of local democratic context, both at the national level, but also regional level. So very quickly, we can point out, for example, two specific countries of interest, India and Bangladesh. Um, both explicitly address platform requirements on freedom of expression, um, demand user empowerment through transparency um, and redress, and they conduct human rights due diligence and report on content moderation systems. But obviously, the context in each of these countries are different. And so naturally the way these requirements are interpreted and implemented would differ. Um, so before we move on to the brilliant panel that we have here, I'd like you all to reflect a little bit on three quick key questions as they present digital platform regulations from their respective regions and countries. So first of all, how would you think about local democratic context? And second of all, what does a human rights based approach to regulation mean to you? And third, are these measurable through re reviewing legislation? So on that note, I would like now to call on the first of our brilliant speakers who may help us provide some answers to the questions, Jackie, policy lead at Global Partners Digital, who will be sharing some insights from a European perspective. Over to you. Great, thank you, Yasmin, and uh, thank you for having me on this panel today. It's really exciting to see some of our kind of initial stages of research uh, presented and to get some, some feedback from you all here today about uh, how we might take this further. Um, so I'll focus my some brief remarks just on looking at some trends that we've seen in platform regulation in the in the region of Europe. And by that, I, I don't just mean the European Union, but also individual nation states, both within the EU bloc and outside of the EU bloc uh, in that region. And I think by looking a little bit at what some of those uh, laws and platform regulation, laws around platform regulation uh, entail, we can get a bit of a sense of um, the trends and the drivers uh, in, in that particular region. Uh, and then 
we'll hear from other panelists um, on other regions shortly. Um, so obviously, to state the obvious, one of the major kind of wins for regulatory convergence uh, when it comes to platform regulation this year has been with the passing of the European Union's Digital Services Act, uh, which I'm sure many many of us are kind of um, have been looking at in detail for for a long time. Um, it's been enforced now as of the 16th of November. Um, but just to provide a quick update um, or, or refresher that the, the Digital Services Act updates the, the previous e-commerce directive and provides much clearer rules around how platforms should be addressing uh, illegal content uh, that's shared by their users uh, and exactly when they can be held, held liable for such content um, if they haven't acted on notice and takedown uh, mechanisms. Um, the DSA also requires platforms to have clear terms of service and redress systems in place uh, for their users, requires them to publish some transparency reports, uh, and crucially it places uh, extra obligations on the, the very largest platforms with regards to human rights due diligence and assessing systemic risks that their platforms pose. Um, it's interesting, Yasmin was just picking up on uh, uh, the the kind of the regulation point um, or how to enforce the regulation and the DSA um, imposes this quite interesting um, uh, kind of framework of regulators whereby each member state will appoint a, a national regulator, the digital service coordinator, but then um, at a higher level than the European Commission itself will be the one enforcing the requirements relating to the largest platform. So we have this two-tiered approach of um, independent uh, regulators enforcing the legislation, which we'll maybe come back to a little bit um, throughout the discussion. Um, and, no, you know, no regulation is perfect and it remains to be seen in practice how this will work. I'm sure there will be improvements to be made to the DSA, but um, I can say that from all of these 55 pieces of legislation that we reviewed that place you know, requirements around how platforms moderate content and, and how they govern their, their services, then the DSA is almost definitely the, the most rights respecting one, whatever that means. It has really strong safeguards throughout for freedom, freedom of expression and other important human rights. Um, and it's very carefully calibrated to balance uh, the risks that services pose with um, the need for a, yeah, it, it's very nuanced. Um, we could we could have a whole discussion on on the DSA, but uh, I'll, I'll move I'll move on um, to what's happening also at the national level. Um, and we we looked at in this data set we looked at some proposals uh, or laws that are already in force as well from Germany, France, Austria, Poland, and Ireland, which are all EU member states. And we also looked at proposals from the UK, Albania, Belarus, Russia, and Turkey, uh, which are not EU member states. Um, now, while I won't go into detail on each of those. Um, regulatory regimes within the sort of five minutes I have here, we can draw through this database exercise, you can draw some kind of top level similarities uh, and differences with the DSA. So for example, most of those um, national level platform regulations also include clear requirements around notice and takedown procedures, although the mechanisms differ a bit between countries. Um, most of them require platforms to have some kind of user complaints mechanism in place, and some of them also require uh, appeals mechanisms as well, to where, where users can appeal platforms content moderation decisions. Uh, most of those national level laws um, also require platforms a certain degree of transparency with their users uh, and, and also with regulators about how they're moderating the prohibited content. Um, and importantly, 60% of those national level proposals also differentiate platforms responsibilities by size, right? So we're seeing this graded approach that the largest platform should have the most responsibility when it comes to managing the risks that their services pose. Um, so there are some similarities, there are also some key differences um, of those national level laws, nearly half of them impose uh, strict time limits on platforms um, removing content once they've been notified, either by a user or by a regulator or when ordered to do so by a court. And that's not something that the DSA uh, has explicitly done. Um, uh, also nearly a third of those national level proposals within the European region Require, actually require platforms to proactively monitor for prohibited content uh, in some way. Uh, this might only be for specific types of content or in specific circumstances, uh, but nearly a third of them do include a some kind of requirement um, to that end. Um, before I pass on to the next panelist, I'll just pull out a couple of outliers within the European region. Um, it's no surprise to anyone that kind of uh, Russia and Belarus and Turkey's proposals don't really align with the DSA uh, so strongly. Um, those proposals include quite vaguely worded restrictions on quite politicized and subjective content types. So they include things like um, 
prohibitions on the sharing of obscene content or content which offends the, the values of the state. Um, so much broader and more sweeping content categories. They also impose, as Yasmin kind of mentioned briefly with respect to Russia and uh, Belarus, they impose criminal sanctions on individual platform employees for failing to comply with, um, with regulators' demands. Yasmin's looking at me to hurry up. <laughs> um, so that, so that's that's an outlier group, there's human rights concerns, and then the other outlier group would be the UK and Ireland regimes, which align in many ways more with uh, the approach taken by regulators in New Zealand and Australia, to an extent Canada, um, and we can maybe go into that a bit more uh, in the discussion. So I hope that provides a helpful overview of some of the things we can see through this data, um, and looking forward to hearing reflections from the other panellists as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I've been told that there there are some audio issues uh, for those joining us on Zoom. So while perhaps the technicians look into it, um, may I please ask speakers to slow down a little bit? I was also guilty of speaking too quickly. So, but thank you, Jackie, for you know keeping up with the time. And um, I was particularly struck, um, well, not really surprisingly, by the outliers that you mentioned in the EU region, because obviously, I mean, the European region, not the EU region, but because when we talk about Europe and the European Union context, we talk a lot about harmonization. Um, but at the same time, at the wider context and the European context, um, the fact that we have those outliers in, uh, in with Russia, Belarus and Turkey, it just shows how the, con the, the larger context in each of the countries can affect regulation. And I thought there was really good, a good point that perhaps we can reflect on a bit more on that. So on that note, um, Juan Carlos, if I may uh, pro give the floor to you for some insights on Latin America. Yes, thank you, Jasmine. Can you hear me well? Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you on behalf of Derechos Digitales for the opportunity to be a part of this session. I will try to slow down as well. Um, as an organization that works in the intersection of human rights and digital technologies in Latin America, our experience is vastly different than that of the European region. However, we can probably find some commonalities with uh, other regions as well. Uh, but I will focus on several trends. Um, it is important to note that uh, for Latin America, there is no regional body that that produces directives or regulation for the countries. Therefore, we find very different approaches from the countries in the region and both laws and attempts at legislation have been scattershot without much harmonization. It doesn't preclude the fact that there is some expectation of better and more aligned uh, standards for the region in this area. But so far, we have not seen efforts in that direction from the governments themselves. So with regards to which narratives have guided this very diverse approach, one very common narrative uh, has been that there are these big, powerful uh, tech giants with outside influence in social interactions and on public debate, um, regardless of which platforms they are speaking about, uh, the diversity of platforms or, or the services or user experiences are not really taken into account. Uh, on the flip side, it is also common to find perception and dystopian narratives around the internet uh, with the platforms as cesspools of filth and harm and misinformation and abuse by other people, uh, which would require governmental action of some kind to induce platforms to do something. These narratives are used and pushed uh, as the basis to introduce legislation that would somehow control or make platforms accountable, uh, mostly by ambitious politicians. And it's common to see in the past few years that legislative initiatives have been strongly linked to very specific figures in Congress in several countries in the region. But speaking directly about the content of those regulatory initiatives and also acknowledging um, what you were showing, Yasmin, on uh, laws that have been passed in places like Brazil and Chile and Venezuela as extremes, uh, probably, of, of what this uh, region shows, is that um, at least uh, in, the, in the previous decade, there was a recognition by the courts and by some law systems that there is need for liability protection, 
uh, for third-party content in favor of platforms uh, in case of uh, actual knowledge of illegality of the content. Uh, in, a broader, in a broader sense in the Brazilian law, for in copyright law in, in Chile and Costa Rica, and, uh, and also for services in, in Paraguay. However, after the panics of the last several years, uh, the focus has been not so much on an idea of the internet or copyright law, but rather on the harms of uh, social media. And it's common to see that new regulatory initiatives are focused on social networks, speaking mostly about digital social networks. There have been proposals to for stronger controls over which kinds of materials are present in networks that could be that could be harmful to children, as there have been initiatives in Colombia and Peru, uh, to regulate online behavior also in Peru, uh, which mirrors what has been said about the Venezuelan law against hatred, but also the Nicaraguan law on cyber security, uh, which penalize strongly certain behavior and certain expressions online. But there's, there, there have also been broader efforts or broader proposals to regulate uh, online platforms, including through establishing new uh, obligations of transparency, redress mechanisms, sanctions in the form of fines as well, and also proposals to block or restrict uh, the functioning of platforms in certain countries. Those have not reached the status of law. However, they have been proposed uh, in the region in places like Chile itself, in Colombia, and Peru, in a copy of the Colombian bill, uh, and also proposed very publicly by a senator in Mexico a few years ago, uh, which was not presented in Congress after public outcry on how strong the measures were in that proposal. Uh, but whether we will see those become law in the next few years, of course, is, is subject to um, speculation. Yet uh, there is very strong push from from the outside for these uh, bills not to pass. Uh, and I think that links to a final point on rules at the regional level. The inter-American human rights system provides very strong protections for freedom of expression and for access to information. Although to reach that status, it has been tested several times in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So whenever these new initiatives have taken place, it has been mostly the efforts of civil society and academia that have pointed out that these efforts uh, do not conform or not adequate to international human rights law and standards. So what we would expect trying to address some of the final questions in your presentation, Yasmin, is that, that any consensus on consensus at the regional level on how to regulate platforms that are often located outside the region uh, has the shared human rights system in view and that it adequately considers how different our national and re regulatory environments are, but also how important uh, it is that transparent and participatory processes are to achieve better outcomes uh, for those processes. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for respecting the time limit again. Um, I'm really happy about, you know, the panelists today. Um, so, um, no, <laughs> so um, you know, I, I was really, I, I found it interesting that you mentioned um, the greater focus these past few years, few years on the harm on social media over the bigger picture on the internet. I thought that was really interesting, and perhaps in the wider discussions you can elaborate why is that? Um, and, you know, the, your point that you made on um, the inter-American human rights system was also really interesting. And obviously that's something that um, I hope our audiences will also ask questions about. So on that note, I was um, after we go, we went from Latin America, we're going to travel to Africa. Um, Gabenga, over to you. Thankfully, it's a short flight, <laughs> in quotes. Um, you know, in, interesting enough, um, 18 years ago, in this same venue, uh, at the ECA, the, the focus of many African countries was the what we called the African Information Society Initiative uh, and National Information and Communication Infrastructure Policies. Uh, I had a, you know, the chance to be the vice chair of the African Technical Advisory Committee then, and it was very promising. Uh, very promising that while there were other regions that were talking about uh, you know, regulation and things, the one thing that many African countries were focused on was increasing access and what was popularly uh, known as ICT for D, ICT for development, how would you get computers into schools and all that? But things changed. Uh, 
uh, and, and, and if you ask yourself, why did that change? It's very simple. Uh, because the politics was very different from uh, the reality online. There were not many people online. You know, uh, you had the Prime Minister of Ethiopia mention the growth from 11 million to 30 million. Uh, in Nigeria, that number jumped from about 200,000 at some point to 11 million, and from 11 million to 86 million. When that happens, uh, then you start paying attention to whatever happens uh, in, in that particular space. And unfortunately, uh, what, what then happened was the, and you can't divorce offline policies and practices from what then happens in the digital space. Uh, because the environment offline wasn't one that was really exactly human rights respecting, that was transported uh, to the digital space. And so when you begin to talk about conversations around regulation, in many African countries, uh, you know, I work with Paradigm Initiative and we've been, you know, doing reports on African countries uh, for the last uh, eight to 10 years. And, and the one thing that we've, we've been talking about for the last two years is the fact that regulation in many African countries isn't focused on regulation in terms of standards. The definition of regulation is actually control. And there's a big difference between control and standards. The problem with control is that it protects the state and agents of the state. The good thing about standards is that it protects everyone. Uh, that's why you have scenarios where there are people who work in intelligence in some of these countries, and I can give a few examples, uh, who you know, propose these policies that protect themselves, and then when they lose power, uh, then they become victims of, of their own of their own proposals, which is which is great, by the way, because it then you know empowers us to be able to say to you know in conversations that if you don't create standards that protect everyone, you will become a victim of your own of your own failures. Uh, and the reason why there is increased attention being played, uh, being paid, you notice that many African countries in the last eighteen months uh, had proposals on online content uh, moderation. In fact, in many countries platforms were literally forced to, to register uh, in countries. Uh, one of the major reasons for that is because the last standing civic space is the digital space. Uh, in many cases, I can't go on TV or put in newspapers some of the things I would say. Uh, you know, I've had many of my colleagues who are you know, talking to a radio station and then the radio station says, okay, we can't continue because we'll lose our licenses. There are countries that we reported on where telecom companies have had their licenses withheld, not renewed, because they did not comply immediately uh, with a phone call that says, shut it down. Without, in fact, the last time that Nigeria did shut down Twitter, it was just a memo. It wasn't, it wasn't, the courts were not open, so there was no legal order. It was, it was just a memo. And this is one of the, you know, the dangerous trends uh, that we see. We were hoping uh, that, you know, uh, the bad, COVID is bad news in any way, in every way, uh, but we were hoping that the fact that trust was going to be at the center of all the conversation then would allow many governments to pay attention to the need to create standards and not to focus on control. Uh, but many emergency laws were created during COVID, uh, which we, we warned a lot about that, that they were going to become the new normal. Uh, and unfortunately, they are now the new normal. I mean, not just in Africa, uh, in, in many other places, in many other countries, where emergency laws have literally now uh, you know, become uh, the new normal. I mean, interesting enough, you know, platforms have not helped too much. And I'm glad that, you know, this is a conversation that also includes platforms. In many cases where platforms, uh, if, if you call yourself a global company, then you must understand the global context. Unfortunately, many platforms are just American companies trying to operate, operate globally. And because of that, context is missing in many cases. I mean, I can give many examples uh, of, of scenarios where, we've tr where we actually you know, do work with platforms to really tell them, I mean, really, you screwed up. Uh, and unfortunately, what happens in that case is governments then use that excuse to then create not standards, but try to impose control. Uh, you know, platforms played into the hands of India, played into the hands of Nigeria, and will continue to play into the hands of many other countries if, if they're not careful. But I want to end with good news. Yes, uh, uh, I need some good news myself. The, the, the biggest you know, news that I think this trend has, has led to is that citizens have since realized that uh, the people that we pay taxes to, to protect us, are not really going to do it, so we have to protect ourselves. From Togo to Nigeria, 
uh, to Zambia, to many other countries. I'm glad to see citizens pushing back. Uh, Togo shot on the internet, uh, citizens went to court, they won at the was caught. Uh, you will see the trend that people don't usually win at local courts, and there's a reason for that. You know, uh, same thing in Nigeria. The Twitter ban has been, de you know, declared illegal, uh, but by the Echo was caught, not a local court. Uh, and and I trust that incidents with, you know, including the Ethiopian shutdown, uh, ongoing shutdown in Tigray, and others will be challenged by citizens. And I think this is good news because it then means that we're forcing governments, platforms and every other stakeholder into a conversation about creating standards and not controlling. Thank you. Um, I really liked the differentiation you made between control and standards. I thought it was a really interesting perspective that I think we can all learn from and reflect on. And also the power of the citizens in a way to, in, to protect ourselves, as you said. So on that note, we're going to do our last journey to South Asia. Um, I'm going to hand over first the floor to Osama, who is here with us um, on the Pakistani perspective, and then I'm going to hand over to Aman, who is online and will be joining us um, on the cyberspace. Um, thank you, Osman, and thank you to Chatham House and Global Partners Digital for putting this panel together. Um, I think it's an excellent design of getting perspectives, putting it into uh, context. Um, so I'll speak a bit about, you know, the situation in Pakistan and largely in South Asia. But when Benga was speaking, you could have just replaced the country's name and the context would literally be the same. Um, so that's quite interesting. There are, of course, a few differences. Uh, but the perceptions and narratives around regulating online content in Pakistan, um, I'll take a step back and talk about, um, you know, essentially there is an effort to uh, exert control and it goes back into you know if you look at historically um pakistan before independence was a british colony uh before that it was ruled by uh you know dynasties that were royal um then our penal code is still the penal code from 1860 that was you know written by the british and it's the same in bangladesh and in india so a lot of our laws are designed by colonial powers that were trying to control subjects in you know the their colony and uh, the the state sort of inherited those laws and didn't change them much if you look at the penal code today so you still have concepts such as sedition you still have concepts such as um uh you know treason and all of these are quite uh, you know omnipresent in the region so in india you also have this issue with sedition uh where dissent is con considered going against the state um even though there are constitutional protections for freedom of speech so there's a similar trend in the region um and and the entire you know narrative of control is pretty much there where the state tries to control what citizens say online and you know like benga also said i wrote a, a column called the last fortress and it was really about social media being the last fortress where people are able to still express their views um, and criticize state policies like they're entitled to as tax paying and voting citizens. Um, so back to history. So then since 1947, then we've had around three to four bouts of military dictatorships. Um, and in that we've also seen a lot of control. It was really in 2008 when, um, you know, since 2008, we've had democratically elected governments in Pakistan till now, and it's the longest stretch of civilian governments in place. Um, and I think that has been good news uh, because what we've seen is that, yes, the state has tried to exert a lot of control and it continues to, but the uh, institutions are strong, such as the judiciary, uh, the media, and the civil society pressure. Um, and, and in that sense, the, these, these actors are able to exert um, influence or have dialogue. The parliamentary committees are open to listening to citizens who are able to call public hearings on laws and issues. So in that sense, uh, regulation has been, um, there has been a very, very, deep conversation around it. Um, so I would, uh, so uh, in Pakistan, we had the Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act that was passed in 2016. Um, 
So notice the word crimes, uh, and it's under this law that uh, platform regulation is done. So there's section 37 of the PICA law, um, and section 37 deals with unlawful online contact. The way it's worded is that it takes the provisos from Article 19, which guarantees uh, freedom of speech, and it says except for, and there's a few conditions. Uh, so that language is picked up and put in Section 37. Um, so it essentially what it does is it gives the regulator the right to interpret constitutional language, um, which obviously gives uh, you know issues of due process and issues of accountability, where the regulator uh, tends to play the role of judge, jury, and executioner when it comes to online content moderation. Um, again, the language is based on the restrictions and freedom of speech rather than the safeguards and guarantees. Um, and under Section 37 is where the rules are made for regulating social media. Uh, so these were uh, formulated in 2020 uh, during COVID. And it was really, um, so when, when the Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act law was being debated, it was done in parliament. And even that was not a very inclusive process. Uh, we were able to, you know, speak in the parliamentary committees and try to propose amendments and point out what the issues would be. And like Benga also mentioned with Nigeria, the government at that time was like, no, this is necessary. And when two years later, they were not in government, their leaders were being charged under the law that they fought for <laughs> by the opposition that was opposing the law when they were in opposition, but when they were in government, they kept using that law, right? So, so there's that you know karma that really comes around. <laughs> so, um, uh, so when 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 we look at the rules, so in 2020, all of a sudden we found out that social media rules have been notified um, and there was no consultation um, and they were called uh, protection against online harms, but there was only protection of the state in that, you know, large, lar large uh, thing that you saw. There was lip service to a lot of protection to, you know, citizens, but the way we see it play out, and I will show you how the evidence that we gather to show how that's done, um, uh, the, the main focus is on controlling dissent online. Um, so, so the groups that are most vocal on decisions around digital governance in the region, so I would say there's there is civil society, um, and, and uh, I think the judiciary has also become active. The regulator is very active, and, and political parties are very active. So, so what, what, what we really see is that the online harms rules were formed, then they, those were, there was a lot of public uh, outcry against them. So then the government said, okay, we're going to have multi-stakeholder consultations and we're gonna revise them. There were some consultations, but they weren't meaningful because the feedback was not really taken into account. And then a new draft was uh, passed. So then we had another, it was, so then they, they stopped pretending that it was against online harms and they called it rules for removal and blocking of online content, right? Uh, which we were like, okay, at least there's honesty around what this really is. Um, and then when those were passed, they were again giving too much power to the regulator. Um, it included fines on intermediaries and it also included uh, stipulations for take, uh, blocking the entire platform that does not comply with government requests. So in the end, and what we've seen, and that's the best news, Yasmin, sorry, is that uh, the, the court stepped in again this year and said this is prima facie unconstitutional and have asked the federal government and the parliament to revise the rules. Uh, so we're in that process and hopefully um, there, something good will come out of it. But, but I think the biggest takeaway from this is the multi-stakeholder advocacy where lawyer groups from the Supreme Court and the Pakistan Bar Council, where journalist bodies such as the Pakistan Federal Union of Journalists, civil society actors in digital rights and human rights space, all got together and did advocacy together, uh, did petitions in courts, did hearings in parliament, and through that, we've had uh, reception, uh, receptiveness from the state. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm sorry to rush you a bit in the presentation. It was really interesting, and there's so much more. <laughs> we can talk about it later, but no. But I like how you started your presentation with you know the the, the heritage of. Um, 
of you know colonial powers and everything in the institutions but then you end up with a good note on the power of civil society i thought it was a really good transition so um so now we have our last uh, presenter in terms of uh, regional perspective uh, joining us online um from india aman over to you thanks sorry can you hear me okay cool yeah so um if i had done this presentation even a month and a half ago it would have been incredibly different uh if you aren't aware uh it's an incredibly interesting time to be a tech policy researcher in india um again historically i would have echoed a lot of the same sentiments um that analysts before me have about uh, some of the narratives around uh, platform governance in india uh, but in the last month and a half, the state has passed or has attempted to pass draft legislation that will uh, fundamentally alter the nature of the internet in India uh, and sort of reverse many of the strategies that it has adopted. Um, but before I get to it, to that, maybe I could just start with sort of a brief overview of some of the sort of features and narrative that have historically existed uh, when discussing platform governance in India. Uh, so the first one uh, and the one that's most vocally sort of proclaimed by uh, researchers in the space and civil society is that platform governance by the state has been incredibly reactionary, incremental, and non-cohesive. Um, if you look at the ambit of legislation that's passed, they are consistently passed by varying ministries with varying uh, definitions that tend to sort of try and explain the same phenomenon. And no one really has a clear understanding of what rules apply where, uh, or at least a murky understanding at best. Um, and when sort of examining the intentions of the state passing these um, regulations, you see sort of two clear trends emerge. One, that the state has a subtly protectionist, or maybe not so subtly protectionist attitude towards platforms with a constant um, distrust of platforms that aren't Indian, uh, viewing them sort of in the context of uh, forces of opposing states, right? Or, or as uh, forces of sort of modern digital colonialism. Uh, and as a result of that, they see regulation as a means of exerting sovereignty over these platforms. Uh, and the state tends to focus on sort of three main types of platforms, uh, social media platforms, uh, e-commerce platforms, and also government and civic tech platforms. Um, so historically, uh, platform governance in India has been the sort of has been under the control of one major act, which is the Information Technology Act, which was passed in the year 2000. Uh, it is the overarching act, which while initially was conceived as an e-commerce act has evolved to now uh, cover platforms as a whole on the internet. Uh, under this act, there are a multitude of rules that have been passed um, and various secondary legislation that seek to sort of regulate various facets of platforms. It's where you find your um, rules on intermediary guidelines and where you find your rules on the processing of data by platforms uh, and whatnot. More recently, uh, you've seen consumer protection rules attempt to enter into uh, platform regulation with the Consumer Protection Authority now looking to um, enforce rules that e-commerce platforms have to follow. And all of this has happened over sort of the last uh, decade or so, but in the last month, uh, the state has in introduced two new draft legislations that um, set the country on a worrying path forward. Uh, the first of these is the draft telecom bill, and the second is the draft digital personal data protection bill. Uh, so the draft telecom bill uh, was released about a month and a half ago. And as it stands right now, it could fundamentally alter the nature of platforms and, and the way in, individuals in India interact with the internet. Um, so for a little bit of context, uh, it replaces a prior telecom bill, which required telecom operators to obtain a license to be able to um, operate infrastructure within India. Um, during the interim, once the once that, uh, license was obtained and since the rise of, um, uh, sort of over the, what we call over the top platforms in India, your Netflixes and so on, um, telecom operators have, have pushed against this license by saying that platforms such as Netflix have an undue advantage. And so the state has responded to that uh, by now imposing licensing requirements on uh, over the top platforms and any platform that has a messaging service on the internet. And it, the state hasn't allowed for any sort of limitations or restrictions on terms of size. So you could theoretically start any business which has a customer helpline, any business that has allows two individuals to 
communicate any information between each other, you would need a license from the state. That flies in the face of uh, the open and free internet that you know the state has historically uh, issued as principle. Uh, on the draft personal data bill, um, the bill does away with a lot of protections that individuals have as it pertains to data rights. And more worryingly, it expands the surveillance regime in India by giving the state wide, sweep, wide sweeping exemptions uh, from civil liberties and from civil rights. Uh, most notably, um, the Supreme Court of India has laid down a few uh, tests that must be uh, adopted when dealing with a, a violation or a curtailing of a right to privacy. Those are done away with in this law. Uh, and so these two bills alone, while not necessarily dealing with platform regulation, directly in the same way that like historical bills like the IT Act have, their indirect effects change the way that individuals interact with platforms. They change the way that platforms can operate. Uh, and so all of this again hap is happening in the background of another bill that the state is looking to pass, uh, which is the Digital India Act, which is still under works. Um, so as the as from the Indian context, um, it's an incredibly uncertain time uh, to be discussing platform regulation simply because no one is clearly aware of the strategy that the state is uh, wanting to adopt. And, and every time we get a bit of information, it's, it seems bleak as, at best. Uh, so yeah, with, with that sort of depressing message, I'll, uh, I'll end. Thank you, Aman. Um, I, I found it really interesting that you said that if we had this presentation one month ago, it would have been completely different. <laughs> Um, and I would be curious to hear, like in our open discussions later, perhaps um, how civil society reacts to those two particular bills that you have mentioned, because I feel like there's a lot of um, implications on the power balance between the government and the civil society and the population. So I would be curious to hear your insights on that. On that note, um, after we've done our travel around the world, um, I will be handing over the floor to Meg, who is joining us from Meta, and will be providing some insights from um, an industrial perspective. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me on this. Um, always a pleasure to be part of these discussions because it's a huge learning experience for us at, at Meta whenever we get to hear what other stakeholders are thinking about when it comes to content regulation. So I lead the Meta, Meta's content regulation policy team um, for the Asia Pacific region. And um, so a big part of the work that I do is participating in conferences like this, as well as consultations with different stakeholders to help inform our thinking about content regulation. And what I think is very interesting um, with all the speakers that have spoken so far is I think it highlights to you how challenging it is for a company like Meta to navigate the global regulatory landscape especially when it comes to the area of content regulation. And I think um, it, it's pretty obvious, like some of the reasons why, but I'll highlight some of that, but then also like highlight how we're trying to navigate some of these challenges and tensions um, across all the different um, countries um, around the world. So like, you know, it's already been highlighted that like legal environments and speech norms vary. So um, all of us, especially the global platforms, have a global user base where we have a broad spectrum of expectations about what expression should be permitted online and what shouldn't. And then we have a lot of different stakeholders as well that have their own vested interest in terms of what they believe is should be expressed online or not. And so having to navigate that requires us then to really think through like the different trade-offs, what kind of standards, because like Venga mentioned something about standards, that's a big part of our thinking in terms of how do we, how do we establish some set of global standards that we can operate under that could at least like address the most common and concerning issues for society around the globe. Um, another aspect that I want to highlight in terms of the challenges is technology and speech are dynamic. There is a broad range of services and products that is not just social media, but other types of platforms, which free expression is also exercised. So how do you regulate all the different ranges of products and services and technologies out there and also emerging technologies that are out there? But to kind of add to that complexity is that the different the, the different types of communication and expression that takes place, whether it's in the form of text or images or video or whatever other types of uh, medium that will like come um, in light to light in the future. Like how do you how do you navigate all of that with with regulation? And then I'll, and then finally, which points to like one of the challenges that we had, which uh, was one of the reasons why I was asked to speak, was about enforcement. How do you then apply and implement these laws? How do you enforce on it? And the one thing I want to say is enforcement as a result of all of these um, evolving as well as competing interests and norms and dynamics, that enforcement will always be imperfect depending on where you're sitting. 
So, um, so you know, one person's, for example, like misinformation being a very good example, one person's misinformation could be another person's opinion. So therefore, like in terms of enforcement, um, it's always now it's always going to be imperfect in some way to someone, even if um, even with there being global standards, given the dynamic and value um, based um, um, place of speech. So, so given all of this, like how are we then trying to navigate all of these different complexities, all of these different tensions and interests across the internet, across different countries and different cultures and mediums? So back in 2020, we did publish a white paper where it was about um, how to chart a way forward for online content regulation, where we outlined a set of principles. And these principles are derived from our own experiences of content moderation as a global platform. It's also derived from all the consultations and like regular consultations that we have with different stakeholders, trusted partners, legal and safety experts um, from around the globe to inform our policies and the rules and the terms of service that we have on our platform that then also informs, informs how we enforce. So even with all the different regulations around the globe, the one thing that we're always trying to do is look at like, how do we take the intention of all of these different regulations? Is it trying to address safety? Is it trying to address harmful content? And look at it from a global lens initially on how do we then create some sort of commonality for all of these different regulations and concerns and regulatory intent, um, and then be able to come up with some global principles and standards. Um, and to guide how we operate our policies and our um, and our enforcement. So the corporate human rights policy, because I think one of the questions that Yasmin already originally asked at the start of this was like, you know, how do you, what does the human rights based approach to regulation mean? So at the heart of all how we operate, we have a corporate human rights policy that kind of is the heart of how we look at product design, product governance, and that's kind of like the baseline for how we approach everything from our own product design and development and launches, um, as well as our rules and policies, all the way to how we even look at how to comply with regulation in the first place. How do we implement and comply with regulation, which I think then goes to some of the points that's been addressed in terms of like state overreach. Um, like how are you how are you addressing those issues as a company? Um, so I, I so I think that's a really key part. And then I think this is why like a forum like this is so important for a, for a company like Meta because going back to what was being said about standards, what we're hoping is by having more of these conversations with like stakeholders like yourself or with other intergovernmental organizations is to come up with some sort of global framework and standards. And one of the things that industry as a whole, not just Meta, is trying to contribute to this conversation is by the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership that we have launched, I think it was a year and a half ago, um, to try to develop what like, at least from an industry standpoint, what are some of these best practice standards for trust and safety that can be implemented globally? And hopefully that can then inform a lot of the discussions that we're having here today as well. On that, I'll leave it there and hopefully we'll be able to have further conversations on this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Meg. Um, I thought it was a really interesting um, perspective that you shared and um, obviously, I, I, I mean, I appreciate that you must be really challenging in a way to navigate all of the sort of the, the entire landscape of regulations, because even within one region, I think no one can agree with each with each other. So I can't imagine if it's a global um, global uh, sort of um, undertaking. So on that note, um, thank you so much for all the panelists. Um, and now, in addition to it being a Q&A, I would actually invite um, participants, both online and in person, to share their insights on, first of all, what forms of online platform regulations are emerging in your part of the world? And in what ways do they diverge with those that have been shared today in our discussions? Second, what risks do, does policy divergence pose to an open and interoperable internet, as well as to human rights? And third, how can these risks be mitigated and what opportunities are there for encouraging harmonization and consensus? Um, I would also invite you to think about it from a multi-stakeholder perspective, so, you know, thinking about it from um, the government perspective or from civil society perspective and also at all levels. I think that's that, that would lead us to a really interesting discussion. So I see that um, we have one hand raised online. Izan Khan, um, I'll hand it over to you. Hi, can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, thank you for a very interesting discussion. Um, one of the kinds of uh, regulation, or at least one of the things that are being imposed in a number of different countries uh, all across the world. So for example, we have 
instances of this being demonstrated in uh, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, places like Brazil, some countries in Africa, and increasingly in uh, the Western democratic world, for example, proposals like this in the UK, to have what we call hostage-taking laws, which are essentially those kinds of laws where you, uh, social media platforms like Meta, for example, or Twitter would need to um, uh, have a government liaison officer or grievance officer that will be able to respond to requests to take down content at the threat of criminal sanctions uh, and prison, essentially, for non-compliance. Um, and this is a very worrying trend that has a major potential to restrict the open and free internet if you consider that some of these laws have the potential for extraterritoriality. So it's not just that the content should be taken down for that jurisdiction alone, but globally. Um, so we risk having this kind of internet where it's not fragmented as one of the main themes of this uh, you know, uh, forum is, but you have an internet where the standard of human rights across the board uh, has fallen. We've seen this increasingly being applied to content for individuals and organizations that are outside that particular country as well. And so one of the questions that I really wanted to ask the panel um, is, in such instances where we have these sort of unilateral measures that are constantly being taken, what can we as you know, civil society organizations and within this multi-stakeholder process actually do uh, about this trend? So the combination of extraterritoriality and hostage-taking laws uh, is one of the very, very big threats to the open internet today, especially when it comes to platform and content regulation. And I look forward to hearing, uh, you know, potential responses about what we can do to challenge this sort of, uh, you know, developments that are taking place. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was a really interesting perspective. And I, I must admit that, um, I mean, personally, extraterritoriality is something that I often sometimes overlook. Um, especially, I mean, I must admit I'm guilty because I'm a lawyer, so it's not really a good thing. But thank you for the reminder. It's, it, and I would be keen on hearing, you know, your perspectives here in the room or um, on Zoom, whether you have anything to share about it. Um, I see that there's a hand raised at the back of the room. Um, perhaps you can go to, towards the microphone and just press the button. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. My name is John Omo. I work for the African Telecommunications Union. Uh, sometimes I, rather unfortunately, I tend to think that we speak uh, for ourselves uh, in this discourse, and, and that for me tends to be the unfortunate bit of it. Uh, governments are in the business of governance, and sometimes we, we don't like it so much, but that's that's the reason for which they exist. Uh, we may not agree with same, some of their policies or indeed most of their policies, but we elect them. What uh, I seem to see is uh, the civil society, and, and this, is, this is where I, I tend to want to see a little bit more openness, the civil society and, and speaking to itself. And, and, and I'd like to see in this uh, such forum, government representatives also sharing their perspectives in terms of why they, they do the things they do, uh, because then it becomes uh, a government bashing uh, forum rather than, you know, perspectives being shared. What, for example, has come out through the gentleman from, from India, uh, and I see that a lot in the sort of work that, that I do. Uh, the EU is, is trying to push back quite a bit on that in terms of platforms and the major European players uh, that uh, invest in networks and, and most of us know this quite a bit. Uh, the networks are saying they have put quite some money in, in the networks and the platforms are riding on these networks and they want to see some sort of uh, fairness in terms of uh, the water that passes through the pipe and the, the, the volume of the, of the pipe, the size of the pipe. And I think that's a healthy debate that we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, you know, uh, close our eyes to what the networks in Europe are saying and, and, and in terms of, uh, you know, fairly sharing uh, the proceeds of, of what, what goes through the pipe. So I, I think there, there needs to be a little bit more openness. I see governments as, as, as bad but not that, that bad as we, we portray them. 
and uh, um, I've never seen most of our governments now, especially in the developing world, increasingly uh, saying that uh, multi-stakeholder frameworks are, are, are evil or not not right. I, I see that quite a bit in the sort of work that I do. Most of our governments uh, realize that uh, it is not the business of, it's not the monopoly of governments to govern, uh, especially in the, in the digital space. And so a lot more of uh, stakeholder involvement in terms of our policy making processes is, is being brought, brought on board. So, so what I'd love to see is uh, how, how can we speak less to ourselves and speak more to all the constituencies that are involved in this process, especially governments. And I see that as, as sometimes the the, the missing link. Thank you. Thank you um, for the fresh reminder, I think. And f uh, just one more thing. Africa seems to be the focus. Africa is, is, is on a table being, you know, sliced. Uh, there are so many initiatives about Africa that I've lost, I've lost count. Why is this the case? The Europeans have theirs, the Japanese have theirs, the Chinese, the Indians, uh, the Americans. Why is there so much focus about Africa? And, and there seems to me to be an attempt at homogene, homo, uh, you know, standardizing the sort of Western values as, as homogeneous and relevant to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I guess it's a really good reminder that this forum is the perfect opportunity for us to all speak to, to each other and learn from one region to another, but also from one stakeholder to another. And I think it's a really good way of sparking discussions. And I see a lot of hands raised here. Um, so perhaps uh, you will go first and then um, the gentleman there. And then I thought there was a hand there. Yeah. And then you will come next. Thank you. I thank you so much for uh, this panel. Um, I work with, uh, my name is Shabnam, I work with the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, where we are analyzing a lot of the laws that you uh, speak about today, uh, according to international human rights standards. Uh, and so it was quite interesting to, to hear, like we get really in depth into these issues, so it's nice to hear the big picture um, and the trends that are happening. Um, so. Uh, definitely one of the civil society organizations uh, living in this bubble <laughs> uh, that the last uh, commenter spoke about. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to kind of say that because this, because of the topic of this uh, session, it's been uh, maybe more government bashing, uh, uh, to quote the last speaker. Uh, but uh, we are, we're often in spaces as well, the same number of us uh, where there's a uh, tech sector bashing. Um, and uh, I think we would all agree that there's uh, a lot of problems with uh, with the tech sector uh, and social media platforms in general, especially those with um, an outsized uh, influence on public debate. Um, and uh, uh, Meta being one of them. Um, so uh, and, and so with all the criticism that's coming from uh, government actors against these platforms, uh, we can agree that the, the approaches are not according to human rights standards, but that the narratives have truth to them. Um, and, uh, and so that's why they resonate uh, uh, well with uh, uh, other members of government and also who might be more uh, aligned with civil society viewpoints. Um, uh, but uh, the, the narratives still resonate with them, as well as uh, sectors of the population. Um, so I guess, uh, and I, I just want to say that um, uh, I'm, I'm from the United States, um, and uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of problems there. Um, uh, and the whistleblower uh, recently, Frances, I can't remember her last name, um, she uh, talked about how wh whatever the problems are with, uh, with Meta um, inside the US, uh, they're much, much worse um, uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, and we've seen kind of a much different approach taken by Meta. I mean, it was interesting to hear about this, uh, the, the global principles, because uh, they're not applied uh, equally globally um, uh, in practice. Uh, however, they're defined uh, as a whole. Um, and so uh, 
uh, we've seen moneyed interests and uh, political interests dominating um, uh, these platforms uh, quite a bit in terms of how they're applied at the at the local level. Um, and so I guess my question is, um, uh, what are the uh, so in terms of supporting human rights um, standards um, within these laws, um, I'd be curious to hear from the speakers, maybe outside of the EU, um, on what recommendations they're offering, if any, to government for how to uh, uh, kind of deal with this uh, 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 issue, but in a rights-respecting way, and what recommendations um, uh, have been proposed by you all, um, and if there's any, um, uh, you know, Feedback, or, or, or do you, do you see any um, uh, do you see that resonating with some government officials uh, that you're communicating with? Thank you. Thank you. That's a really interesting question. Um, perhaps we go to the gentleman first, and then afterwards we we can have one or two speakers um, to answer the question that was asked. Thank you. Thank you. And my name is uh, Owen Bennett. I work for Ofcom, which is the uh, independent communications regulator in the UK. I, I'll first say that this is this panel is precisely the reason why I love coming to IGF because it's so rare that you get to see so many different perspectives and comparative issues raised in one place. So it's a, it's been for me it's been a tremendously informative. Um, if I may just give one comment and then ask a question building off it. The, the comment I would have is that we've spoken a lot about trying to kind of harmonize or, or avoid divergence in the way in which different jurisdictions or regions treat these issues. To be honest, at least from our point of view in Ofcom, we don't really think that's going to be possible or even in some respects desirable because I think um, one of the previous speakers mentioned the fact that there's always local context. And when I look at the duties that Ofcom has in the UK under the Online Safety Bill, many of those are informed by some of the specific issues that have emerged in the UK around social media platforms over the last 10 years. And they are going to be necessarily different from the ways in which other jurisdictions have, uh, have experienced those issues. That said, there is certainly a lot of ways in which we can collaborate, at least around kind of regulatory toolboxes. So one of the things that we are working on like in, in the UK is trying to work with other regulators and other jurisdictions about seeing, OK, we might have substantively different laws or we might care about different things. But to what extent can we align the tools that we're using? So, for instance, increasingly, um, many jurisdictions are using things like risk assessments or transparency reporting or information notices. And even though the legislations may be different, if we can somehow try to converge around shared understandings or shared ideas of what, what best practice looks like, then there's, a, there's a, um, a good chance we can avoid some of the divergences. But I do think, for instance, the, the speaker from, from Meta mentioned the need for, for global standards. I think that we're a long way from that. And I think it's going to be, for the tech sector, it's never going to be as easy as it has been in terms of global compliance. Um, the comment, sorry, the question I would have for the, for the panel is that we, for instance, in the UK, uh, we, have, we have an online safety bill and, and Ofcom is, is starting to, to implement that bill in, in some respects. And we're engaging with many other regulators around the world who are interested in understanding the approach and how the approach could be, be applied. And obviously, um, we, our, our approach is informed by basic, we have legal standards we have to adhere to, we have certain, um, we're bound by a Human Rights Act. And so the question I would have for the panelists is, when we are engaging with other regulators who are seeking to, to implement these regimes, how should we do that to ensure that, yeah, the things which make these laws work and make them rights protective also get transferred over and that they, they aren't kind of dropped in the, in the process? Thank you. Thank you, and it's a it's a really good perspective that you're sharing. Um, um, perhaps uh, one thing that I would in, uh, throw to the table in terms of discussions is, of course, standards on a global level might not be possible if negotiated by governments, because obviously it's, there's a lot that we'll, people don't really agree with each other. We interpret things differently. But how about standards that are being led and initiated by industry, and especially big tech companies like Meta, where there is no such constraint in terms of government differences and the, the, politic, uh, the political powers behind it. That would be something I'm, I'm keen on hearing your perspectives about. I know that Juan Carlos said that he wanted to uh, reply to some of the questions, and then I'll hand over to Osama and Benga, and then we go back to the, around the questions and interventions. Yes. Uh... 
thank you for the interventions, especially the last one gave, gives a very good perspective on some of the things that we need in terms of mutual learning. Uh, even in countries where we do not necessarily have specific uh, regulators for things like online platforms, I think the general principle is a good thing to learn. Um, I wish to respond to some of the things that were uh, commented and asked uh, from the non-EU, non-US perspective as well. Understanding at the same time that, again, um, the Latin American experience has very diverging starting points, even in terms of the political landscape that feeds into the regulatory discussions. Um, but uh, there were a few questions on, so what do we do? So how do we also connect with the narratives that do resonate with the population and with some of these decision makers? I wish I had all, all of the answers for that because I would probably be sitting there like actually providing the solutions instead of discussing them. Uh, but I think I, we need to also acknowledge that the rest of the stakeholders or the non-governmental stakeholders do have very diverging views. Even there are some diverging views within civil society, even within each region, for very specific things like how does this operate? What are the mechanisms to engage with uh, the accountability of uh, companies and platforms? So those are very difficult questions. and. And because uh, we do not necessarily have a one single vision, one of the things that we have proposed many times when we have seen this kind of initiative of like regulating online platforms in a haphazard or or a broad way is that what uh, governments or legislators need to do is open up processes of discussion, um, basically to bring this discussion to the largest amounts of experts, uh, investors, stakeholders, as and the public in general, as can be possible. One of the things that was uh, very uh, kind of hurtful when when we saw one platform bill presented in TLAB uh, a couple of years ago, uh, or a year ago, it's been a long time, um, was that uh, the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression of the Inter-American System of Human Rights, he was asked to come to a hearing in Congress. And one of the things, two things that he said were, one, that the bill, he could not support its adequacy to human rights standards in the Latin American region. But second, and most importantly, that he was, um, he, he decried the fact that a work that had been done for over 10 years of developing human rights standards in the Latin American region, in the inter-American system for online platforms was not taken into account, that it was ignored, that the previous work, uh, the previous work by the uh, inter-American experts uh, and, it, and their office was ignored. So um, also one thing to mention there is that there was convergence between the non-governmental, non-legislative stakeholders against this bill. And I think even if we might not uh, be able to bring, um, aside from our regular role as advocates and intermediaries of tech policy with the public in terms of explaining what uh, all of these rules and proposals mean, at least what we can propose uh, towards solutions is pathways that hopefully are as open, transparent, participatory, and based on evidence as possible, including by assessing what other countries and regions have done before to see if those are, have been solutions that have been able to, to some degree, be one, on one hand respectful of human rights standards, but on the other hand, effective against the things that it wants to control or effective in, uh, in making uh, platforms accountable. This is a very exploratory, uh, experimental, probably uh, period in history for this very fast moving subject. However, um, to go back to the standards that, that have been developed, but also principles of democracy and participation, I think are key elements towards trying to, be the, to build a consensus that also has legitimacy with the public, which is also expected. Thank you. Um, can I just say that even though with the pandemic, we've all lost our notion of time, <laughs> um, we just have over uh, 
15 minutes left and I would like to spare the last five minutes for the speakers to uh, sort of provide some quick fire last minute conclusions at the end. So if you can please keep your, um, uh, your interventions short and I'll be ruthless from now. If you speak for more than one minute, I'll interrupt you. So sorry about that. Uh, so Usama, over to you. I feel like I'm back at Model United Nations. <laughs> Okay, so I'll be quick. Um, just one thing on government and platform relations. The reason governments do clamp down more in the majority world is because platforms are failing. Uh, platforms are failing in moderating in local languages. Platforms are failing in allocating resources to understand local contexts. And platforms are failing in prioritizing the issues and conflicts that are taking place in the majority world. And that creates a vacuum for the state to fill in to bring in these regulations. Um, and with budgets bigger than most governments, I'm sure the platforms should be able to manage it quite, quite effectively if they prioritize this. So I think that's one necessary thing. The second thing I want to speak to is about, you know, exchange between regulators. And I think that's great for regulators to learn from each other. But I would implore regulators to learn from the citizens and the right holders whose rights are affected consistently. And I think that multi-stakeholder engagement for regulators is essential. Um, we've seen how laws brought in in Europe, such as the Net ZG and Avia law in France, were cited by governments in the global south saying, oh, look, Germany's doing it, France doing it, why can't we do it? And then in Germany, Germany, you have a process where you get rid of that law, but in other countries, authoritarian regimes are regimes that are, you know, leaning th towards authoritarianism will bring those in and say okay you know these europeans are doing it so why are you disagreeing but you need to understand that you know the, the local contexts are different but also the rule of law environment is different uh so sorry co copy pasting off. stuff cannot work and that's it i'm done <laughs> <laughs> sorry i was a i was a model un kid so <laughs> go venga over to you you know, I'm, I'm tempted to gloat when I hear governments complain that civil society is talking to themselves because for many years, governments talked to themselves and didn't listen to civil society, but we're better than that. So uh, the doors are open and I'm glad that this is multi-stakeholder and we're talking to, you know, we're talking to all stakeholders. And, and to be honest, there are so many platforms and conversations on the continent that governments are invited to and they ignore. But uh, I trust, uh, I'll talk to my brother after uh, and I will, you know, I'll give him a list of, of those places where governments have refused to go to so that we can have a conversation about governments also being in the room. Why is Africa on the table? For one, we're in Africa right now uh, and it is an African country that at an internet governance forum prevented people from taking their phones. That's an, I, this is an IGF, Internet Governance Forum. Why shouldn't I take my phone into an opening ceremony? Because one person is scared that you know, they may want to attack him. But it's all right, it's all right. Ofcom, um, I should just add 10 seconds to what you said. The biggest problem in translating expertise is hypocrisy. When you struggle, but you come into the room and say, oh, this is what you do and you pontificate, what happens is dictators, and authoritarians use what you've done as an excuse. And like Osama said, when you correct it, the struggles are not communicated. You come into the room and give examples of what works. And I think we need to be a lot more open about the struggles. What are the struggles that you've had with your process? How did civil society react to the online safety bill, which I'm a bit aware of, you know, the conversations you had, pushback and all that. Let that pushback be part of the conversation. It, it doesn't help. When you come into the room and say, this is how to do it, this is how we did it in the UK. Because what you then do is you hide, you know, the entire part where you struggled to get where you are. I think the need is, let's move away from pontificating and hypocrisy, we're good, East versus West. Let's come to the table and have honest and difficult conversations. We're all struggling. Thank you. Um, Sorry, I, I have like this really bad tendency of unmuting myself from Zoom. I think it's like three years after online meetings. Um, so we're going to go back to the interventions. Um, I promised to hand to the gentleman. One minute, please. Okay. Um, just to, to reiterate the fact that the reason why government isn't in the room and there are government people in the room is because they choose not to be. It, it's that simple. Uh, they can't complain about 
nonsense. The thing that I, I picked up in the presentation, in the initial presentation, and in most of the discussion as we've continued, is that we're looking at regulation of platforms historically, and and part of how the internet, you know, kind of grew the way, you know, the way in which it did, was that there was a notion of safe harbor and treating network operators and service providers as not publishers unless they were given um, notification. So, so the entire premise was there is a legal safe harbor if the content is bad and you know that it is bad, you have to act or else you lose your safe harbor. The hostage taking, and I think that's the perfect term for what is coming up in some of these laws, um, actually puts the responsibility onto the platform. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's the diabolical opposite of what, we, what, what we're sort of are supposed to be, be, be doing. What I'm concerned about, though, is that the, 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 there is an incentive, particularly on malevolent states, um, to go after the platforms because they think of them as an easy target. And that undermines individual accountability. If somebody commits an act of hate speech in a country, that is that person is who is accountable and who should be accountable. The platform should only be accountable in so far as they fail to remove the content on notification on knowing of its existence. And I'm I'm quite concerned that if we don't in our engagement and in how it's analyzed and in reports and so on, look at the history of safe harbor laws in the United States, particularly Section 230 of the obscenity and so on. And speaking of obscenity, I don't know how Russia can have uh, an obscenity law if and still have content that includes Vladimir Putin. But we uh, we need to differentiate that from, from more active moderation. And I think we do need to sort of go back to what Safe Harbor came about, what takedown actually entails, and this idea that a platform ought to enjoy legal protection uh, and, 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 and we ought not to view somebody as a publisher merely because they're, they're disseminating unless they know that it's wrongful content. Um, and, and that's just oh, my, my critique to, to Chatham House on their report and, and, and so on. Thanks. No, it's always useful to have feedback. So thank you very much for that. I know that there was a gentleman at the back here who wanted to speak, but um, I don't know if he's still here. If not, I know you, you wanted to ask a question. So, oh, oh, you're... The after this gentleman then um so we have one question from here one question from there and then perhaps i'll take one last question if okay one last the last person here and then we're gonna go to the um quick fire round of um conclusions from the speakers so do you want to come here too i i, I don't know if okay Thank you very much for this opportunity. Actually, uh, a few good news we have heard during these few days, uh, uh, apart from the uh, multi-stakeholder uh, ap approach that we are uh, uh, seeing here, it, w one of them was the UNESCO approach to provide a universal global kind of the framework for regulating uh, uh, a social network. Whether or not it, it, it is possible, I think uh, it's very ambitious and it's good to have such a, such an idea. But uh, I would like to add uh, to your very interesting comments that uh, the gap that the government is going to intervene has created uh, essentially by, 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 by the tech companies themselves. And we have some shared concerns that regardless of the different contextual uh, sociopolitical contexts, we have some shared common concerns that uh, tech companies, they could do something to fill the gap, a uh, very, very common gap. One of them is being depoliticized and not to act in double standards. For example, we have seen some complaints from a few countries that some terrorist uh, 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 education training or some kind of the hate speech very clear cut and very, uh, very, very uh, uh, symbolic uh, cases of the uh, hate speech is happening over uh, meta platforms, Instagram and Facebook. But they are not doing anything on those countries because of their political approach. And also, they are implementing some unilateral sanctions, for example, imposed by the US because of, uh, because of their 
comp uh, complying with the uh, US based regulations and laws and it it is something that has created a lot of problem yeah sorry that's I really... all yeah. <laughs> thank you for giving me this your seat <laughs> Sorry for kicking you out. <laughs> um, so you, okay. So um, we had one last uh, intervention from here. If you can borrow someone's microphone. <laughs> Sorry. Um, hi everyone. My name is Nom Shato. I'm from Media Monitoring Africa in South Africa. Um, that actually sounded quite a yeah. Um, I think one word I've been hearing is, well, two terms that I've been hearing. Uh, when we're speaking on global framework, um, obviously looking for a global standard, etc., which, I mean, it, it works. But I think the ideology of uh, one hat fits all, is, is, I think, is quite problematic. And I'll tell you why. Um, in South Africa, when we're looking at community standards and guidelines on social media platforms, hate speech might not be the same terminology in the US or in Ghana or in any other country. And the problem with that lies in when it's a serious digital offense that needs to be taken down, but however the guidelines do not act accordingly to the, 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 the community guidelines. Um, but on the side note, I wanted to add and, and, and ask on this was that um, we're speaking on government and sometimes government itself doesn't have the literacy and knowledge to actually engage when you're talking regulations. They themselves don't understand the acts and legislations, et cetera, that they're actually speaking on and implementing. And what can be really done there? Because as much as civil society does come to play and all the other stakeholders come to play to actually try to help them understand why we need to implement such. Um, but at the same time, you still find them obviously having that kind of pushover effect and them taking lead in it. Thank you. Sorry about being <laughs> the Grinch here. Um, so now, uh, as we conclude our session, I, I swear we could go on forever. I think it's one. I, I think it's my favorite um, session in the IGF. Not biased at all. <laughs> but I'm gonna go in the reverse order of speakers, and I'll ask each of the speakers to prepare, to, to to share a 30 seconds quick fire conclusion. So yeah, I hope you're warmed up. You know. <laughs> so um, Meg, if you can sh if you can share your thirty seconds quick fire conclusion, please. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'll focus in on standards itself because I do think that there can be a global standards. Industry is working on it, and when we say standards, I think a lot of us have different ideas of what standards are and the level of granularity. So what we're trying to do from an industry standpoint is create at least a global baseline standards. And examples of this could be like ensuring all companies have a human rights policy uh, to address a lot of the issues that you guys are all talking about here, right? That there are guiding principles around human rights that all companies should be should be abiding by is one example of a global standard that could be set out that all, all companies do. Another one is transparency standards. That's a starting point for accountability is providing transparency into how Sorry. Um, different platforms operate. Time's up. And user empowerment <laughs> could be another one. So I think like in terms of standards, I think there's a way to go about it that can work as a global framework. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, Aman, you're next. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my, I guess, last point would just be on not thinking of platforms as passive entities. Um, so when we think of regulation in the Indian context, uh, we think uh, we are extremely skeptical uh, because we often don't have tend to think of regulation as being well-meaning or, you know, furthering the rights of individuals. And I think we've spoken a lot about the role that governments can play in regulating platforms. I think platforms have an equal responsibility in ensuring that their services are, you know, properly functioning within, within um, majority world states, properly funded, and that they push back against um, provisions of regulations that do violate human rights, you know, surveillance provisions. You see it in India where like Twitter and WhatsApp are attempting to push back against surveillance um, uh, requirements. So I would just uh, advocate for platforms to be more active participants in this discussion. Thank you very much. Osama, you're next. Um, thank you. I think for me, uh, the interoperability of the global internet is very important, and we're moving towards a world where there's too many borders on the internet. We've seen how Russia has been cut off since the conflict, China cut itself off. We're seeing how governments are censoring in particular ways, and I think that's problematic. So the global standards are possible, and I think uh, community standards and rules that social media platforms are pretty good. The issue is with local context implementation, and I think that's where the solution can possibly lie. Thank you. Um, 
Rubenga. We definitely need to talk to each other more. Uh, we need to break the silos and talk more to each other. Government, civil society, private sector, and everyone. Uh, that's one. Secondly, when we label things Western values, I get worried uh, because human rights is universal. And the truth is that in the African context, we can talk about Omoluabi, we can talk about Ubuntu. These are locally understandable concepts that define human rights. It's not Western values, it's human values. Thank you. Um, Juan Carlos? Yes, thank you. So um, I agree that standards are good and possible, at least to, to some degree, but kind of empty without implementation and accountability. So for regulatory initiatives to be as good as this panel in terms of depth and knowledge, uh, those regulatory discussions that are taking place everywhere need to be also as open as this one and also more open, uh, also echoing that we need to include even more voices. And also they all need to be very sensitive to local uh, uh, frameworks and local understanding as well. Thank you. Jackie. Great, thanks Yasmin. Yeah, just to echo other panelists really, I think we can acknowledge that different jurisdictions are trying to solve different problems and maybe in global minority countries then child safety might be the big priority, whereas in other contexts then hate speech in marginalized languages is the most pressing issue. I think we can acknowledge those differences but also uh, yeah, advocate for a human rights centric and human rights based systematic principled approach and that's where I think the global forums uh, will be really important. On that note, um, thank you so much, everyone, for coping with me. <laughs> um, thank you for the panelists for joining us and for the really brilliant stellar um, in interventions from everyone. And I hope that we can all stay in touch. Thank you very much. And thank you to you for moderating it so well. <laughs>